Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am Farish Rattava uh with the managing responsible for technical product marketing. I'm also joined with Einstein Stenberg, uh, the CTO of Mender. Last time we had a demo session like this uh, was with Mender 2.7, which was released uh, this past April. Uh, Mender 2.7 allowed Mender to expand beyond OTA updates and introduce uh, optional add-on packages uh, containing a set of features for solving other device management use cases like troubleshooting and configuring. On September 28th, uh, Mender uh, 3.1 was released, which uh, introduced the third add-on package, uh, monitoring and logging. Uh, this package contains a set of features to help ensure that all your devices, applications, and services are healthy. This webcast will, will demonstrate the 3.1 features to our valued Mender users. You can use the chat box to submit your questions and we will get to them at the end of the webcast during the Q&A segment. If we do end up missing any questions from the audience for any reasons, we will make sure to reach back out to you with the answers. With that, I will pass it on to Einstein. Take it away, Einstein. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Hello, everyone. Um... I'll go through the agenda first. So at first, we'll take a look at the add-on models uh, or add-ons and the model uh, of add-ons in Mender, just as a quick reminder uh, for those of you who know it already. Then we will uh, dive a little bit into monitoring of IoT devices, uh, what this means and uh, what are the problems that we have in, in this uh, area. Uh, and then we will finally wrap it up with taking a look at the Mender monitor add-on, both how, yeah, how it's different from other solutions, as well as how it works. And uh, I'll show a couple of demos as well, so you can um, get some tangible uh, examples. So if we start with the add-on model in Mender, uh, Fashad already went through it a little bit, but uh, it uh, covers basic device uh, management needs. Uh, so there are several add-ons. I'll show you them in on the next slide. But the point is to cover some basic needs outside of over the air updates uh, that relates to device management. Uh, this is due to feedback from many Mendo customers where they have like a VPN service, they have to have it just to set up a remote terminal or something, some extra infrastructure that they have to develop. And um, we figured out this is something we can pretty easily support. So we added that as well. Uh, and yeah, the point with Mender and this add-ons uh, together are to avoid the need to build your homegrown uh, solutions for, for management managing devices. They are completely optional, so you don't uh, have to install them. You can remove them from the device and the server side as well. Uh, and you can choose the ones you need. So what's here already, uh, obviously in, in Mender and the Enterprise Edition, we have role-based access control audit log that's uh, on the foundation of both the OTA in terms of security, but also the add-ons. The first add-on that we have released in 2.7 uh, is the troubleshoot one. This is to resolve uh, support issues real time in a secure way. You can see some of the features included in that add-on package. Uh, one key one is remote terminal. And we have configuration, which is about customizing each device to its environment. Uh, so this could be like setting the time zone, uh, or network credentials for uh, individual devices based, for example, on where they are in the world. And the la yeah, so this one, uh, these were released in number two, seven in April. And the last one uh, is monitor. This is the new one that we have introduced in number 3.1. And the point of this add-on is to detect and analyze health issues of devices, services, and applications. I'll get more into this uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But first, let's start with 
uh, what um, is monitoring of IoT devices? What are the problems that we uh, we see there? Uh, also, what's specific to IoT with respect to monitoring? So, if you've ever worked in customer support, I have. I have um, first-hand experience with this, so I know how how this goes. Um, but if you don't have any kind of monitoring solution, this could be a very familiar scenario for you. Uh, so you would be the vendor here and you have some, some customers that are using your product. And um, pretty frequently there will be one of these customers saying that it doesn't work. So in some generic way, your product doesn't work or some part of the product doesn't work. So what you do as a vendor, you start to wonder what's uh, what's wrong, what are the symptoms? So maybe it's the UI uh, that has some issues, it's hanging, not responding. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe it's an internet issue, uh, but it's not. So you go down this uh, path and then you don't really know Okay, uh, maybe if you can collect some logs and some information about processes, I can, I can look further into it. Uh, but of course, the customer doesn't necessarily know what you're talking about there. So um, you have this kind of mismatch between um, the understanding of what's actually going on in, in the field and uh, how things look from the customer's perspective. And of course, uh, as this goes on, um, the customer will have downtime because the product doesn't work in some fashion. And you will be spending the time on supporting and trying to yeah, go through this dialogue until you figure out what's actually the, the root cause. And during this period, the customer will, uh, will be quite dissatisfied, especially if, if you're not able to get to the the problem. So the promise of monitoring, um, how would it look differently? First of all, it would be upside down. So instead of the customer reporting issues to you, uh, it would be the other way around, hopefully. Uh, so uh, in this case, you would detect the issue with the product and you could ask the customer, okay, now, found the problem and uh, uh, we know how to fix it. So can we uh, deploy a fix, for example, as an OT update uh, at noon or midnight? And the customer is happy with that, then it's fixed and then you get a happy customer. So that's uh, the simplified version of, of this. But in the essence, it's about knowing um, proactively how your devices are behaving in the field and being able to um, detect any issues and, and analyze the root causes efficiently. That's the overall purpose of monitoring. So uh, this might be a bit ab abstract or simple uh, examples, uh, but uh, we have spent quite a bit of time of uh, speaking with many of you probably on this call and, um, and other users uh, of IoT devices. And here are some typical reasons that things fail in the field. Uh, the one is that you could have an application that's running on the device, or you definitely do. Uh, but one of them, at least, is very important that it needs to be up and running all the time, maybe it's driving the UI interface or um, uh, or something else that interacts with the user. Uh, and if that one is restarting, crashing, or hanging, or doesn't work as it should, uh, this would cause a customer support issue. Uh, what happens in IoT is that you, you have this pretty hostile environment in some cases. You don't really know how uh, the network is going to behave or, or the power for that matter. Uh, so you haven't tested all these uh, different parameters or different um, yeah, ways the, uh, the environment can behave. Uh, 
and then you could have system peripherals that are uh, being disconnected it could be a simple thing as a, a cable being unplugged somebody tripping over it or it being loose um, uh, if it's a device that the customer directly interfaces with uh, it could be a door uh, security a door security system and you have a keypad and this gets disconnected obviously you cannot get in the door uh, or it could be a screen for example if it's a yeah device with a display and uh, you could also lose connection at the device uh, so maybe the wi-fi if you're using wireless which 60 70 percent at least of them and their ota users are then uh, uh, wireless could as you know um, be a bit weak go offline um, or even if you're having cable connection this can be disconnected as well uh, so these are some of the typical example of what's happening it's applications behaving differently once you place them in a new environment uh, peripherals not properly connected or they get loose over time or you lose connectivity and all of this uh, can trigger support uh, issues with the customers So we have done quite a bit of research, as I mentioned, and uh, looked into what's being used in the field today in terms of monitoring. And as you can see, the vast majority is using homegrown solutions. Um, I've also included, uh, just for you, so you know, uh, using some open source tools within this homegrown category. Um, so homegrown is you have to develop some, at least some infrastructure yourself, maybe a client or a server or some transport mechanism. Even though you're using some open source components, uh, I've still classified it as homegrown. And that's simply because uh, there's so many open source um, components out there that you would use uh, open source solution within your solution regardless. Um, it's so, um, uh, yeah. So, um, so there are so many open, uh, solutions that are uh, open source today. Uh, and then um, off the shelf product, this would be a product that can solve this problem and to end. And uh, if we dig a little bit deeper into the homegrown category, the people who have already done a homegrown solution or created one, uh, what are they saying afterwards? Um, the first one here is uh, that it's a minimal functional implementation, not completely built out. Uh, yeah, you can review after the fact, no alerts. Uh, so these are, yeah, some things are missing. And the last one I had here is that it's a non differentiating feature, um, essential for operation. But would like to have something off the shelf. And uh, once I saw this, I felt like this was very similar to uh, how the market was for over the air updates back in 2014 and 2015 before we started Mender. Uh, it was pretty much the same, like large shared homegrown. Um, what was built was very basic. It missed a lot of robustness features, no rollback, uh, didn't support signatures. Uh, and uh, also people spending time on developing uh, these kind of homegrown OTA solutions as well, uh, when they really wanted to develop their product. So if we look at the, the architecture of a typical monitoring solution, so this would include all of the ones that I listed in Homegrown and as also all the off the shelf ones uh, that we looked at, uh, it would look like this. So you have a, a device um, 
Linux device or yeah, Edge device. And it sends uh, um, some metric or some data point to uh, a server that lives in the cloud or uh, yeah, on your on-premise infrastructure. And uh, these metrics get stored uh, into a database and then they get uh, processed. So maybe there's something interesting in all of these metrics. And uh, you create some alerts typically um, because you want to find some signals in all these metrics uh, and store those alerts, but you also send some notification, typically through email or Slack or some other service. And at that point, a uh, user uh, would investigate what's wrong, typically. Um, but uh, if you look at the history here, uh, the first monitoring solution using this kind of architecture uh, is probably around 20 years old by now. And uh, I guess many of you have uh, heard about the grandfather of monitoring, which I would call Nagios. Um, and things have evolved and developed over time, but the same basic architecture is still being used. Uh, it's all been built back then for server infrastructure monitoring, which has placed some um, assumptions on the environment, obviously. Uh, so, for example, one thing you could ask in IoT is, uh, are what's happening if these devices do not connect or are not connected all the time, and uh, what's what's the bandwidth being used here because those are more important questions in iot than for example server where you can always assume that the server is up or otherwise you can create a new one basically so looking more into that uh, how is what are the characteristics of the iot environment that are important in this context uh, so obviously uh, the iot devices they're remote uh, so they're hard to reach um, physically. You cannot possibly drive to all the devices and fix them. Um, whereas in server infrastructure, this is a bit different because um, at least you have a data center and most of the servers are there. Um, and uh, the lifetime is also quite long. Five to 10 years, I would say, is fairly conservative. Uh, uh, you can easily have devices living 30 years, for example, especially within uh, manufacturing and uh, um, transportation, uh, like airplanes or boats, cars, trucks uh, are longer. You have a reliable network, and this is the most important uh, difference when it comes to monitoring. So connectivity is intermittent. Um, Wi-Fi gets lost, devices move around uh, and change addresses and so on. Uh, you can only do outbound connections from the device. Uh, there are actually monitoring solutions, assuming you can connect to the devices, which is obviously not going to work. Um, yeah, because they move around and they're behind firewalls and uh, network address translations. Insecurity uh, obviously also comes from wireless networks. You don't control where the devices are and bandwidth is a very important one to keep in mind as well. Uh, especially once you have LTE or cellular network or even satellite networks. You have to worry about the bandwidth and the costs associated with it. And the last one is uh, unreliable power. So you could lose um, run out of battery, uh, or uh, a friendly user might suddenly unplug the device. When it comes to the first two, those make monitoring more important because you need to keep, um, you need to keep informed what's going on on these devices since they're far away, you cannot do it physically and uh, they are supposed to live there for a long time. 
but the last two make monitoring quite difficult because they're harder um, to connect to and harder to get data from in a secure way. So with those uh, two categories, what can you do? So you can either build your homegrown solution. Um, then you will get you what you need uh, if you do it right, architect it correctly. But big drawback is you can you get less focus on the product development. Or you can use a solution that's built for the cloud. Uh, then you can pretty much just install uh, some client and server and get it up and running. Uh, but uh, given that they're built from the cloud, they're not reliable uh, for IoT, and especially with respect to connectivity. They assume that the device can always send data all the time. And it's also using quite extensive amounts of bandwidth. So what we figured is we need better options for monitoring, and this is where we started. Uh, when looking at the Mender Monitor add-on. So let's dive into Mender Monitor, how it's different and how it works. So first of all, the purpose is to detect and analyze health issues of devices, services, and applications. Uh, you can easily add it to your existing Mender plan and the devices you have in the field uh, using an OTA update. And it's also end to end. So it has a separate client uh, called Mender Monitor and uh, uh, has at least one microservice on the server side. Uh, it's built for IoT using edge processing. So this comes from the previous um, discussion that uh, we went through. So I'll show you uh, the architecture. So we already went through the one for. Uh, yeah, that's used mostly in the cloud, but it's been around for 20 years or so. And in this case, uh, devices send data continuously, and most of it is not going to be useful. It's just sending CPU is 20%. Okay, not, not very interesting. Um, but with uh, Mender, we introduced the edge processing approach. Uh, so this will only send data when you have an alert. So there is something uh, that interesting that happened. So that's when we will send the data. And it's also offline capable. So the processing of the alerts and metrics um, happen on the device. They are stored there if uh, something happens uh, when the device is offline. Uh, for example, a process dies. And then they are synchronized to the server. Uh, so the only thing the server is doing is, is uh, storing the alerts and uh, uh, sending the notifications. So if you look at the difference in the architecture, you can see that basically the, um, the data and alert processing is moved from the server to the device. And that's why uh, we call it edge processing uh, for monitoring. And uh, most importantly, what, what do you get out of this? Uh, so you can now support intermittent networks and uh, devices being offline. You wouldn't lose the data or the alerts that happen for that data while it's offline. It would be processed on the device, and simply the alerts would be um, uh, synchronized once the device is online again. And uh, the, a big one is that you save a lot of bandwidth. So if you remember, the first approach would send data all the time from all the devices, whereas the edge processing approach would never send data unless there is an alert, so a process dies. So this will vastly reduce the bandwidth, um, depending on your use case. Uh, it would be expected at least to save 80 90% of bandwidth. Uh, we have also an overview of the alerts in the UI and API, so you can see what's gone wrong. Uh, there is notification support via email. It's being sent to the users you already have in the Mender server who have access to the device through role-based access control. 
don't need to configure anything. Uh, you can monitor services and applications using system D and logs uh, or log files as well, which supports pattern matching and will collect the lines before and after the match to make it easier to diagnose the root cause of the problem, not just the fact that it has been matched or not. And it also respects log rotation, which is commonly used to avoid disks filling up. So with that, we can dive into the first demo. Um, uh, this one is about uh, monitoring um, system D service, uh, in particular, uh, the VPA supplicant one. You can switch this one for any uh, that you want, your own service as well, as long as it's being run under systemd. Uh, it's very easy to, uh, to enable it. And we'll go through how to do it from scratch. So I haven't set up any monitoring on this device. The only thing I've done is to um, install the monitoring software, which you can do during the uh, onboarding. And we'll also take a look at the filtering uh, capabilities and the status in the UI. Okay, so let me go to the Mender uh, environment. So this is the one device I will do the demo with. I'll use the um, remote terminal that we have in the troubleshoot add-on to do the demo. Uh, as you can see, there is a new section here called monitoring. Uh, and right now it doesn't have any alerts that are triggered, so there are no issues reported. All right, so let's set up a new uh, uh, monitor. Um, so it's basically just two simple commands. So one is to create uh, a service monitoring for VPA supplicant and tell it that it's type systemd. And then I just enable that monitor and that's it. Uh, now this is being monitored and I can now stop just for testing it, we can stop the service that we're be, uh, that's monitored. And uh, if we go out from this, it's already updated. So this will show you the status of currently monitored services. And you can now see it's not running as you would expect. And uh, of course, now I'm looking at this device, so it's uh, a bit, uh, uh, I already knew that something would happen here, but um, if we look, uh, let me see. We will also get an email about it soon. If, yeah, I just refreshed it. So you will get an email. It will tell you that uh, the service is not running and you can uh, yeah, follow the link here to take a further look. You get the same uh, to the same place as here. And you can also uh, filter on devices that uh, that have monitoring issues. So right now it's just this one. Okay, so that was the first demo. Um, and let me go to the next one. So in this case, uh, we can monitor log files. So in the previous one, I monitored systemd services. Now I'm going to monitor a log file. And the example use case here is that I have a peripheral that's attached to the device and now it gets disconnected. And this is a condition I want to know about. What I'll do, I'll monitor the kernel log and I'll look for a patch, uh, pattern USB disconnected. Uh, and note that this, will, uh, this match will expire after 24 hours by default because this match or this pattern will stay in the log obviously for a long time until it gets rotated, but you can set an expire in the configuration and by default, uh, it's 24 hours. And we'll take a look at the log lines before and after the match. Okay. So let me go back to the terminal. And in order to monitor the kernel, log for this pattern, I will do this. 
So now I create a log type. I give it a name, um, kernel USB disconnect. The pattern, you can use regular expressions. I will yeah, just do the string itself and the, the file, the monitor. And then I enable the same. Uh, yeah, check that we just created. Now, what I will have to do, um, so let's see. So it's still not triggered. It's only the VPA certificate one. But if you can see, I have this device here. And I can pretend to be a user. And I can unplug ah, this cable, which would make the door not open because, oops, um, because it's the keypad is disconnected. And now you can see, again, that this was detected. Uh, and uh, you can filter on this like we just did. And you have gotten a new email that the USB device was disconnected. So hopefully this, uh, oh yeah, I forgot. But let me also show you that um, you can also get the log lines. So this was the matching line of the pattern. So this was what we were looking for, USB disconnect. But on itself, this might not be that helpful. But you can show the previous and the next lines as well. This is now the last line in the log, so we cannot show the next lines. But if anything was logged afterwards, you would see that here as well. And how many lines are connected before and after, you can configure. OK, so let me go back to the slides for a little bit. And I did want to mention also separately from monitoring, we uh, many of you have requested naming and tagging devices. This is now supported uh, in Mender Tree 1 as well. So you can change the name of a device um, to a more human friendly one. If yeah, it's a bit special device or you don't have that many devices. And you can also tag devices uh, with key value pairs, uh, like for example, the customer or the location it's in. This is, both of these are only stored at the server side so that you can use them to create groups and filter devices. And obviously you can see them when you look at the given device. And it's available in all the plans and open source as well. So in order to try the new features, if you found this interesting, uh, the easiest way, sign up for a new free trial. Uh, even if you have an existing account to test it out, I would recommend just sign up for a new trial with a new device uh, so you don't mix it with your current environment and you will get all the add-ons available um, for free for 12 months if you sign up for a new one. Uh, there's a new get started as well, uh, in particular for monitor that you can follow. You can find it if you go to the main get started. And we have a separate section covering all the add-ons in the Mender documentation. With that, I hope you found this uh, interesting. Uh, thank you for uh, watching. And uh, for Shad, please let us know if there are any questions that came in. Yes, uh, thank you, Einstein, for that. Uh, um, please go ahead and use the chat box if you have any questions and uh, we will answer them. Um, the first question is actually from Scott. Um, does the monitor service allow custom integrations? Example, generating alerts from custom applications. Yes, so you can uh, integrate it uh, with most other solutions on the device side by using the log monitoring. Uh, so if your application uh, or other monitoring solution outputs some logs, which it typically does, you can monitor those using Mender uh, and they would be processed on the device. Um, so yes, this is definitely possible. Uh, great. Uh, another question here is, can the monitor daemon receive signals through Dbus? Yes. 
uh, it can monitor signals. Um, so I guess this could be two, two different things. So uh, I didn't demo this, but it does support DBus monitoring. So if you have applications that send DBus signals and you want to watch for certain signals, uh, for example, connection issue or something like that, that's being emitted to DBus, uh, the Mender monitor can connect and, um, and analyze DBus streams. Um, but when it comes to sending, uh, sending messages to the monitor daemon itself. I do not believe you can do that over Dbus. Uh, I don't think it exposes uh, a Dbus uh, API. Uh, on the Manda client does. Uh, but if you have any details about your use case for that, how you would like to control the Manda monitor, I would be happy to take a look and follow up on it. So just email us or type type it in the chat. Great. Uh, the next question from Karthik. Uh, does the Mender add-on have REST API operations available? I have an Android device connected to Mender and I'm building a custom setup with your REST API service. Yes. And this is the case for everything we develop. We add the REST API. So whatever you can see in the Mender UI, uh, you also have REST API available for. So it will wait, uh, work in exactly the same way that, that your existing integration does. Next question uh, from Yuri. Do you offer some integration with uh, Grafana Prometheus? That's a good question. We don't do currently um, out of the box. It's been something we've been discussing, um, but yeah, not currently. What we do have currently is, uh, are the REST APIs where you can get the currently triggered alerts and uh, alert history. So I believe it should be fairly straightforward, but um, uh, yeah, we, we don't have that out of the box currently. Great. Uh, the next question for Matthew: uh, What would you be? What would be the recommended way to monitor an alert on a metric such as CPU temperature or CPU load? Yeah, this is also a quite interesting question. Um, so you cannot, as you saw in the first version, uh, you cannot see, for example, these metrics. Uh, it's simply because they're not being collected from the device to save data. We are looking if we should support that for single devices on demand, because they can be very useful. Uh, if there isn't, you know there is an issue with a single device and you want to see the metrics of the Wi-Fi or CPU Wi-Fi strength or something like that on that device. So that's something where um, we're planning to support for single devices. When it comes to alerting, uh, this is also not uh, like alerting on system um, resources like this. Um, it's not something we have support for out of the box today, but you can do it um, by having a separate process that um, it's a little bit of a workaround, but you can have a separate process that looks at the CPU usage, for example, and it would log any high usage to a log file, and then the Mender monitoring uh, client can pick and look for patterns in, in that log file. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's how it is today. Great. I think I have a question for myself. Uh, how do you uh, how do you integrate the monitor add-on with existing OT plan? If you have an OT plan. Sure. So uh, this is available just like any other add-on. Uh, there are two uh, aspects to it. So one, if you're using hosted Mender, um, you need to add it to your plan. Uh, so this is available. Uh, through, yeah, my organization. I can show you quickly. Um, or, 
here is it uh, upgrades and add-ons. So you simply just check this box and submit a request and we'll handle it. And then in terms of installing the, um, you need to install the client software as well. And that is covered uh, through our documentation and you can create an OTA update to deploy that to any devices you have in the field. Great. Um, just uh, giving a, a few more seconds uh, from anyone, please, if you have any more questions, just a reminder, use the chat box and uh, we can answer them. Um, I think one, one other question for me would be, how does role-based access control apply to monitor? Yeah, so a role-based access control is quite interesting. It uh, applies to everything. Um, so uh, what we've done, you can see like monitor, you can get email notifications and you can also see the alerts for a device in the UI. So that's how you can get the um, information about monitor. And we have a permission uh, called read uh, in so read devices, basically in Mender, you can assign that to a user. The user can read a group of devices in Mender RBAC. And if you have read access to a device, you would be able to see it in the UI. And therefore you can also see the monitor alerts, but you can also get the email notifications um, so if you do not have read uh, access to the device as a user, you will not get the email notifications either. Great. Uh, I see a couple more questions coming in. Uh, from One from Swan Chu, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. What is the memory footprint, footprint of these add-ons? That's a good question. I don't have it for all the add-ons um, right in front of me here. Um, so I think we would have to follow up on that one. Just to give you some idea, it's around 10 megabytes for the Mender client. I believe the monitor add-on, you're talking around one megabyte, but I'm on a little bit thin ice there because I, I yeah, I, I didn't, um, check it but we can definitely get uh get back to you on that great uh one another question from karthik can you point me to the documentation for rest api for men and monitor i think uh yeah. sure so uh if you uh go i can show you quickly um if you go to uh, server side apis here uh, it would be part of the management APIs. And uh, you should be able to see it here. Uh, yeah, here it is, device monitor. And this will, like all the other uh, APIs, it would provide you with uh, samples for Python, Shell, Go, uh, all the popular languages that you can use to yeah, list alerts and uh, the things that you saw in the UI, so it should be quite easy to uh, to integrate. You're welcome, Karthik. Uh, you're welcome, Matthew. Uh, I guess uh, any any more questions? I think we have one more minute left here for the folks. Um, just giving it a few more seconds. Uh, we'd like to appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. Um, thank you, Einstein, for the presentation. Thank you, audience, for showing up and uh, for those really good questions. If you have any more questions, please do reach out to us. You know our email, you know our website. Uh, we're always here, here to, to, answer, um, to answer any of your questions. Uh, with that, uh, we will end the session. Thank you.